Father, again, we thank you that we can, that we have the ability to, to, to uh, praise you, Lord, that you've, uh, you are, in fact, um, Emmanuel. You, you tabernacled uh, with man. You became man, is what your word says, and, um, and you dwelt among us. And, uh, Lord, we do not have a God that uh, is detached uh, and uh, but Lord, you are, you have connected yourself uh, to creation, um, to your created thing. You've loved us in that manner, and uh, Lord, so we, we, uh, Lord, we just want our our minds uh, to truly understand who you are and uh, who you say you are, and uh, and what you've revealed to us, Lord your nature, your character. And as we continue in the uh, study of Romans, Lord, uh, give, us, give us ears to hear. And uh, Lord, I do pray uh, for clarity, uh, but also for uh, just a, um, en- encourage all of us to search the scripture, to, to continue uh, to look uh, to you, the author and finisher uh, of our faith. And uh, just uh, may you receive glory and honor today as we uh, get into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so. Here's our, here's our visual outline of the book of Romans. And again, our focus has been on the revelation, the revelation of the righteousness of God. Okay, this is our, this is our main focus here, are these, uh, through this section of uh, scripture. And so that being said, can anyone tell me what doctrine we are studying? What doctrine are we studying? What doctrine are we? Soteriology. Soteriology, salvation. All right, good. Okay. So um, I think you know it. I think it's just the, sorry to put everybody on the spot. So so we've been studying, yes, uh, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, as it pertains, this is important, as it pertains to the believer, okay, because we have to keep in mind our audience who Paul is writing to. So we're, we're looking at salvation then as it pertains to the believer. And again, let me ask you this question, I think you can get this one, where should the church get its doctrine from the Bible, okay? The body of Christ should base its doctrine on the very word of God. And what does the Bible say about itself that we saw last week? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so doctrine, again, what we're studying is what to believe. Reproof is what not to believe. So the Bible does reproof us if we have a false view. And because, you know, again, you have to keep in mind, all of us were ungodly sinners. We were saved. And so our mind was changed at that point, And that's the whole point, is that it continues to be subject to the word of God. And then... What uh, Paul is talking about there to Timothy, instruction and righteousness, then, is how to behave. And that's what we've kind of looked at, because we've looked at unrighteousness. So we should have, thus far in the book of Romans, a good definition of what unrighteousness looks like. Uh, And Paul will talk later about, you know, what righteousness looks like. But right now, he's laying the foundation to those that he has not yet met in person. He's what heard of their faith all the way and it is the faith it is the definite article there it is it's not just some random facts all we've heard about them talking about Jesus and no it is what he's heard is the very gospel he's he's heard report that they are sharing Jesus as Messiah and that he died for people's individual sins he's hearing of their faith and so that's what he's responding to and he's saying, I'm trying to come to you, you know, but the Spirit has prevented him. And I think one of the reasons that the Spirit has prevented, prevented him 
is so that we have the book of Romans. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> if, if Paul would have went there, guess what we would not have? The letter to the Romans. So there's, there's, there, are, and, and it probably go, there's probably multiple reasons, but that's just one that I've uh, observed. So instruction in righteousness, how to behave, correction, how not to behave. Uh, and all of us love the correction, right? We all love to learn how not to behave. N no, but but it, why then? Why? What's what's the significance? Why? Again, it's it's God has given us His Word that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, God wants the believer, this is his will, to be complete. He wants him to be equipped so that we are able and ready to do good works. Not just some, but every. So that we're ready to do any kind, any variety of good work. And that's what the scripture instructs us. That's how it, it again, it corrects what we think, uh, you know, what to believe, what not to believe, how to act, how not to act. So, then according to the word of God in Romans 1.17, let me ask you this. How is it that the justified in Christ shall live? By faith. So, the just shall live by faith. That's Romans 1.17. As a believer of the gospel of Christ, having been justified freely by his grace, we are to continue to live by faith in God's word. This is how we live, by simply faith resting in the promise of his word. And Hebrews 11 tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, who is the author of Hebrews writing to? The saved or the unsaved? He's writing to the believer. So, if you want to please God, take him at his word. Trust his word. Trust the instruction that it gives you on what to believe, on what not to believe, on how to live and how not to live, how to behave and how not to behave. That's it simply. Trust that he who is able to justify you by his grace, because we've trusted that he's able to justify us by his grace, he's also able to practically, progressively, sanctify you by his grace because you are in fact positionally sanctified before God you know God sees it as a done deal but we have choices and so when that instruction comes at us we can say no thanks I've got it from here or we can allow the word of God to change us now concerning the doctrine of salvation Somebody tell me specifically what stage or phase of salvation we've been learning about, and I just talked about it. What? Well, specifically what we've, no, I'm sorry, not just there, but what we've been talking about. What is Paul, what are we, how are we, how do we get the imputed righteousness as well? Justification. Okay, thank you. Yes, perfect. So justification. So again, soteriology, the do doctrine of salvation, we are talking about justification, and uh, specifically we've, we've been learning about justification and the imputation of God's righteousness. And again, can anybody tell me just a simple, quick definition of justification? To be acquitted, free of charges, be pronounced and treated as righteous. So last week, we noted two Old Testament individuals that Paul uses uh, then uh, to, um, as proof, um, 
of those who were justified by faith apart from the law. Now, we just noted them, but uh, who did we talk about last week? It's right there. Abraham. Okay. So, I'm trying to give you guys answers, too. Man, geez, no, I'm kidding. That's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, believe it or not, if, uh, if it weren't for the grace of God, I'm, I, would, I would be back there somewhere. So, Abraham, who lived before the Mosaic Law and even circumcision, and again, we looked at him and we directed our attention to verses 1 through 5, where we began to observe Abraham's justification by faith. Okay, this is what we were looked at. Now, how does God relate his righteousness to ma- mankind? So it gets from him to you by imputation. Okay, this is a new slide for you, uh, but I realized that we probably need to look at that. And uh, that's actually because that's what Paul actually goes on to do. You know, imputation. The word that is used there is that accounted to him for uh, righteousness. The Greek term logizomai means imputed, credited, reckoned, or counted. Again, this is an accounting. Uh, it's, an ele- it's a legal term. It is accounted to you. Uh, and this is Paul's emphasis then in, uh, in three, 3 through 8. When you go back and you look and you highlight and you just could do an overview, he's saying, you know, uh, the first point there is what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he says, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So if the motivation, and that's the logic behind Paul's argument here is, and if the motivation of your heart is to try and earn God's righteousness by works, you have not trusted God for your justification, and the sin debt still belongs to you. That's what this is saying. That's what that verse there and uh, verse, uh, excuse me, verse four is saying. To him who works, you're trying to earn then, then that wage then is counted, is not counted as grace. There's no grace in that because you're saying that, sorry Jesus, your blood did not cover my sin. I've got to do something else. And that's, that's, that's works. So, but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So that should be pretty clear, but it now if your heart is being motivated by grace as demonstrated by God in the cross work of Jesus Christ, then it is of faith in the sin debt that you are fully aware of is paid in full. Do you see the distinction? Do we see that distinction? Now, according to what we just read in God's word, can anyone tell me who God justifies? The unjust or the ungodly. It says, him who justifies the ungodly. The ungodly man's faith is accounted for righteousness. That's the main That's the main uh, argument that Paul is talking about here and then how it gets from God then to us. So as we continue our verse-by-verse study of the book of Romans, we'll look closer at these two examples, um, Abraham and David, who both bear witness to this doctrine that Paul is talking about of justification by faith apart from works. Again, Abraham, that we've looked at, he was represented in the patriarchal, what we refer to as the patriarchal period. And then David is representing the monarchy period. And these are two two different kinds of periods because Abraham was before the Mosaic law was ever even, you had no, he had no idea that was coming um, because it was to Moses and not to Abraham, for one. But 
but you know, that's, that's future. And so uh, today we'll, we'll take a look at David uh, a little bit and then we'll hopefully get back to Abraham. So um, I want, before everybody gets too comfortable, if, we, if you're able, if you're able, let's stand just to uh, read the word here. And uh, so, proof of justification by faith from law is what we're looking at. And today, David's testimony, justification by faith, if we get there, the priority of faith to circumcision. But here we are. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as righteousness, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or, upon the, un or on the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then is it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which, are, uh, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. You may be seated. So he says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. All right, so let's go back and uh, look at this uh, closely. So, blessedness in this verse so it says just as David also describes the blessedness of the man and blessedness in general is a pronouncement a pronouncement of being in receipt of special favor please remember we are still discussing the judgment of an ungodly man before God in the courtroom of heaven this is our setting okay Paul, Paul hasn't left the courtroom yet, right? So in verses 6 through 8, then, David's pronouncement is God's legal verdict declared towards the lawless, sinful man who simply does what? Believes, has faith in God's only begotten Son. And so... David, let me ask, is David, you should be able to get this one, is David before or after Christ? Before, okay, well before, right? So David, in verses 7 and 8 says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now who, what Paul is referencing here is Psalm 31, 1 through 2. And I believe this is actually the very basis because the way that Paul argued was he didn't build an argument and then use scripture to support it. Paul knew the text. He knew the scripture. That was the basis of his argument. Because remember, Paul's mind had to change from Judaism to what actually God is saying. I mean, a complete different mentality, a complete different mentality. 
Because what, what Paul is, is teaching against here is what he used to believe. He knew all very well who Abraham was to the Pharisees, to the Jews. He knew all very well who David was to the Pharisees and to the, Jew, to the rest of the Jews. He knew. You see, this was his belief. Remember, he was a Pharisee. And his mind changed. When he saw, when he heard the crucified Christ, and he changed his mind, and he received the grace of God, it was dynamic. And he didn't go out and start preaching and sharing right away. He went away for several years, and he relearned. He went back to the scripture. He was discipled. So, so then here, not only is this a verbal pronouncement as we've defined this blessing, but there is also an imputation of God's righteousness. Remember, we looked at that word, the imputation. That's how it gets. So just like in the beginning, when God said, as we spoke this morning and talked about this morning, let there be light, and there was light, God says to the ungodly person who believes the truth of Christ's gospel, you are justified. And he imputes to him his righteousness. God speaks, and it is so. He has declared him justified in the courtroom of heaven. You see, Paul has brought all men, including Abraham, do you realize how poignant, how much of a prick this would be to the heart? Because what, what he's done here is said, guess what? Abraham was ungodly. What? You know, to the Pharisee, to the Jew? He was lawless. He was even before the law. You see, the, the implication of what he's saying is, man, talk about, and this is what got Paul beat, Okay? <laughs> understand this is what got Paul beat understood understood this is what got Paul beat so all men are lawless whether in principle or in deed even Abraham and David were ungodly prior to believing God's word you see no one no one is able to keep the law even though the Jews were the they were the legal recipients you know, they were under legally the Mosaic Covenant. And remember, the, the, uh, the, they, they made an oath. You know, what God's, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. And then did they keep that oath? They did not. And just read the history. You know, they were unable to abide by it in practice. And, and even in, you know, e e e even in their heart, they couldn't, you know. So however, it... It is the lawless, licentious, and ungodly man whose deeds are forgiven and whose offenses against God are covered when they exercise faith in the Son of God, in the gospel of Christ. And this is now, now specifically the gospel of Christ. I brought it to us, but again, what Abraham believed, we'll get into that probably next week, but this has been the case, you know, for him uh, to believe God and credit, be credited for righteousness. This has been the case since the original sin in the garden. You know, as we talked about earlier today, who covered Adam and Eve? God did. Were there fig leaves that they sown in self-righteousness? Were those good enough? No, it's not good enough. It only, it, it, you know, again, God, God could see right through them, and so God you know, then uh, makes a, 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 a sacrifice which to them, you know, and, and to us would be unfair because that critter didn't do anything. It was, it was Adam, you know. But the, but the fact is they received those coverings and they believed. So he goes on and says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. W what? Wow. Are we hearing what David wrote here? And do we, have we kept in mind that Psalm 32 was written by David in response to the grace that he received after acknowledging the fact that he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah? 
that's when these were written after the fact. After the fact. He was already King David. He was already anointed by God. And David says, he describes the blessedness to the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. You see, and this is in 2 Samuel 12, 9 through 10, okay? That's, the, that's where um, the prophet confronts uh, David, 2 Samuel chapter 12, 9 through 10. I would encourage you in your time, I don't have time to get into it today, to read this account on your own in 2 Samuel 12 and closely observe David's response to God's discipline here. Because what I'm not saying is that God doesn't discipline the child of God when they choose to act out. That's not what I'm saying. But what David is saying, your sin shall not be imputed to you because you've received the imputed righteousness. And as we'll see here, but there are consequences for your actions. And read through that and pay close attention to how he's disciplined, how there's discipline, and then David's heart in the matter of this and his response. So, and that being said, uh, Dr. Dr. Tom Constable explains that Psalm 32 is one of David's penitential, excuse me, penitential psalms, which he wrote after he had sinned greatly. See, Paul not only proved that David believed in imputed, uh, believed in imputed rather than, uh, than earned righteousness with his quotation, but he also showed that when a believer sins, his sin does not cancel his justification. Your, your justification before God is a legal matter, and it's done. You've been justified. But again... You know, pay, pay, pay attention when you read that to, to David's understanding and motivation of grace and, uh, and the things that he uh, says there. Now, once God declares the lawless man justified and God's righteousness is imputed to him, the judgment is eternal. Okay? So Warren Wiersbe has this to say, and he clarifies the reality of the one who has been declared righteous in the courtroom of heaven by God. Wiersbe states, David made two amazing statements. One, God forgives sins and imputes righteousness apart from works. Two, God does not impute our sins. In other words, once we are justified, our record contains Christ's perfect righteousness and can never again contain our sins. Christians do sin, and these sins need to be forgiven if we are to have fellowship with God. And he references 1 John 1. But these sins are not held against us. God does not keep a record of our, a record of our works so that he might reward us, or God does, excuse me, keep a record of our works so that he might reward us when Jesus comes. That is works that are done um, abiding in Christ. But he is not keeping a record of our sins. Do we get that? And that's what this statement is saying. Your sin is not imputed. Blessed is the man Again, this is a declaration, and this is grace, everybody. This is a picture of grace. Did David deserve to continue in his kingship? Absolutely not. Not according to man, not according to us. God did, but the sword never left his house. As I've heard it said, and my daughter can probably tell you this, you can choose your sin, but what? You can't choose your consequences. <laughs> so the priority of faith 
to circumcision then? What does he say? So we're moving into then section three here. It says the priority of faith to circumcision. And this is uh, chapter four, verses nine through 12. And he says, does this blessedness that we've been describing that you know doesn't impute sin, that is apart from works, then come upon the circumcised only or upon the circumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. So let me first off, too, make sure that we understand that, that faith in, in the Greek pisteo is to believe, trust, or have complete confidence in. Um, th- those are just a few, just a few, but this is, this is what this word means simply. It just means to believe, trust, or have complete confidence. So, so and it's transliterated from the Greek word Pisteo. And again, in, 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 as we said before, faith requires what? An object. Now, I don't have a chair, but, you know, we exercise faith to, to, to a certain degree, you know, all the time to where we, you know, we sit down and trust that the pew is going to hold you. Uh, you know, we, we, we go and we get in the car and we trust that it's going to start. Now, does it always start? No. Mine didn't the other day, but, uh, but, you know, it doesn't always start, but, you know, we, 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 we exercise a certain amount of faith, so, you know, again, and that being said, you know, obviously, you cannot fully trust uh, those things because they do fail, but as we talked about this morning, you know, God is faithful and true, and uh, he's just, and the justifier, he is one that we can put our faith in, and so in verses 9 through 12, then, Paul is asking this question, you know, he says, and there's a couple questions here, actually, when you look at it. He says, does it come upon the circumcised only or upon the uh, un- uncircumcised also? And we'll get into the next question next. But he says, for we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. But Paul, is, Paul will use a chronolog- the chronological events of Abraham's case then, because we're back on Abraham, to further develop the biblical doctrine of faith. So he's going to use chronological events of Abraham. Okay, now we're looking at this chronologically. uh, That we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Okay, so he says, how then was it accounted? And then he'll say, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised. And these are really two different questions because it's really how and when, right? So how and when was God's righteousness accounted to Abraham? And he says, you know, this, again, keep in mind this chronological question then presented by Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, was faith accounted to Abraham for righteousness while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while uncircumcised or not while circumcised, excuse me, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. You see, Abraham was declared righteous prior to circumcision, how? By faith, by faith. And he says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. So what is, what is circumcision? Circumcision is an outward physical sign of that inward spiritual reality. You see, God had made a covenant, and he had cut a covenant, and this was a sign of that covenant, right? Right? Now, did he have to wait for that cutting? Or was faith or was righteousness credited to him prior to that is the question. And it was prior to, correct. So Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum again explains, he says circumcision is the token of the Abrahamic covenant. 
It did not establish God's covenantal relationship with Israel, but was a sign of this covenant by itself. Or, or excuse me, or a sign of this covenant. By itself, circumcision never provided any blessings. Again, because what blessing could come from circumcision when you think about it, you know, physically, like what, you know. So, but to Abraham, again, it was a reminder not only of this, you know, this covenant, because again, he just, you know, he just had this promise at this time. And, and then he says, you know, it, it was a personal, to, on an on a individual level to Abraham, it was a reminder of the righteousness of God that was credited to his account by faith. It was a reminder. Think of it this way. Every time a Jewish man's nakedness was exposed, there was a significant reminder of the unconditional covenant that God cut with them. But individually, again, this is an individual thing. So this was why, you know, this is how it should have started or how it should have continued. But Fruchtenbaum goes on to explain that circumcision, again, uh, uh, was a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, firstly. And secondly, circumcision was also a seal. This means that it was the outward evidence of the righteousness of faith, but not the cause of it, not the cause of it. So my question is this, is God's righteousness credited to the, credited to the ungodly through ordinances? Because this is what Paul's talking about. He's talked about works. Now he's talking about an ordinance. Because this ordinance was given. This was something, in fact, they were supposed to keep. So, so then, again, is God's righteousness credited to the ungodly through ordinances? No. No. According to the word of God, righteousness was not even accounted to Abraham through the ordinance of circumcision. According to what we just read in scripture, when, when was Abraham circumcised before uh, or after he exercised faith? After. And the account recorded in Genesis, Genesis 15, 6 of Abraham believing God, catch this, pay attention, the account recorded in Genesis 15, 6 of Abraham believing God was at least 14 to 15, some say more, years before he was instructed to be circumcised in Genesis 17. So let's just say for sake of argument, it was 14 years. So what are the ordinances given to the church? There are two. What are they? Baptism and communion, baptism and communion. Those are what are given to uh, the church age believer. And so what is the significance of the church's ordinances? You know, both ordinance are symbolic. Both ordinance are symbolic of the accomplishments of the cross work of Christ. Both of them. When believers participate in these ordinances, we are visibly proclaiming the gospel message of Christ. For, furthermore, when we take part in these ordinances, then we are then stepping into obedience by faith in what God has commanded to do, commanded us to do. You see, we're actually, when we do that, we're actually stepping out into, into faith, trusting you know, what God has commanded us to do. But please keep in mind, and it's so important before I go any further, that these aren't just commands, do them. These are, thank you, God, for this wonderful way that we get to relate to you and remember and remember and remember the shed blood of Christ and what he paid for our sins penalty. That's what it's about. It is a glorious, a wonderful thing that we get to do. We get to do it by the grace of God because His grace has been shown to us in this manner. This is what we get to do. It's not, oh, we must do it. No, that's not, that's not what it's about. Again, our, 
image of who God is and, and, and what a command is and what love is. I love my kids so much that I'm going to tell them, hey, don't go play in the street. Look both ways before you cross the road. You know, don't speed. Don't do these things because I don't want to see your physical death. God does not want us to spiritually, you know, he didn't want us to spiritually die, and he doesn't want our physical death. He wants, he wants us to have life, and life abundantly, and he wants us to have, you know, living by faith, trusting him as our father, trusting him as our savior, trusting him, yes, as our Lord, but also we, again, have to understand this dynamic of who God is and how he represents himself in his word. That's where our, our thinking is corrected, is through the word. Because I can sit here and think and think and think according to my own, but if I don't have the word, it's just my thinking. It's just my philosophy. It's how I'm working things out in my mind. So that being said, you know, communi communion is something... It's, it's a repeated proclamation, or excuse me, actually, let me back up, because baptism, uh, I, I skipped here, but baptism is a one-time proclamation of a believer stepping out in faith into obedience, and its purpose is to display what has already taken place inwardly, publicly. It's an identifying issue. It identifies the believer with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. I know this slide is small uh, in font. I can print it out. But do you realize that there are seven baptisms spoken of in the New Testament? Seven baptisms. You know, and we often think every time we come across the word baptism, it's got to be a wet one, right? Actually, there's only three that are, three that are wet and four that are dry. So, here's all the dry ones. Baptism of Moses, that's actually old, uh, spoken of in 1 Corinthians, but it's Old Testament. Baptism of the cup, baptism by the Holy Spirit, baptism of fire, baptism of John, of Jesus, and of church-age believers. And so, each one of these, you can look, you know, if you want to take a picture, that's fine, or if you want this, I can print it out for you. Uh, the subject, uh, and actually, I meant to to do that, but the, but the subject you can see here, and the sphere, you know, basically what it was in reference to, and then the results. So there, and the bottom's cut off, but this is, a, this is a, of a book, and I don't have it on there, but it's, it's a by Dennis, a by Dennis Roxer. And so, all these baptisms are mentioned, so, you know, the, the term in, in simple baptizo, like the Greek term, you know, it, it just means to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to cover, to submerge. And basically, it has, it, it, it's not wet unless the context makes it wet. Does that make sense? If the context says something about water or something like that, that's when it's wet. If it doesn't say something about water, check it, you know, put it in context. What are they implying? Okay. We, we, we jump to these things all the time and, you know, oh, baptism, oh, it must be wet. Oh, salvation must be pertaining to a man standing before God. Oh, you know, I, I did this. This is why, you know, I, I used to do this all the time, all the time. And, and it, you know, again, that's part of the confusion. And so the word of God then helps us in these things. So then communion, uh, changing gears to communion, it's a repeated proclamation that we're going to take part in today. And it's, again... It's done through obedience, a, a, a believer that has, has faith and, and, and security, you know, in Christ. They've trusted Christ. They put their confidence in Christ as their Savior, you know, having him, his shed blood has paid for their remission of their sin, and that's what their trust is in. And so now we take part and step out into, uh, you know, in faith and take communion. Its purpose is to remember the good news of the cross work of Christ. You see, when the body of Christ participates in communion, we are remembering collectively, as a body, we're remembering, because this is part of our fellowship, it's, co, it's communion. Individually, we're having communion with God, but also we do this as often, you know, uh, 
we do this when we get together because that's the biblical example set before us. Now, when you and your husband and or wife are at home or your children, you know, these are things that you can do there as well. If you, if, you know, if you want to do that, I mean, it's not just something you do here. Again, this is something that we can practice in our home. But, but again, it proclaims the cross work of Christ simply. We're remembering and again, visibly proclaiming to one another Christ's atoning death on the cross. So just a couple things, uh, and this isn't exhaustive, but just to put up a couple distinctions and uh, you know, discontinuity, continuity, however you want to look at it. Church age ordinances, baptism is one time, it's public, it's a proclamation, it's commanded, but it's by, again, by faith. And communion is ongoing, it's private private uh, individually, but also private in the household of faith. And it is not only just a proclamation, but again, you know, and this is as well, but this is, you know, this is identifying and this is identifying. But then again, it's commanded. Uh, it is an ordinance, but it is also, we do these in operation of faith. Having known, you know, again, what's the motivation behind what we, that's what I'm trying to get at what's the motivation behind why we do these things you know is it just because we're commanded well we just got to do it or do we understand this joyous wonderful communion that we get to have with and in the lord and all that he's done for us to be able to 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 partake of this again just like the jewish man you know through circumcision it was a reminder it's the same thing you know, even the Mosaic Covenant had an ordinance. Anybody remember what it was? It's the seventh day, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. So even the Mosaic Covenant had an ordinance. So, um, so what's the point? No man is safe from sin's penalty by works, nor then are they saved by keeping these ordinances. In other words, neither baptism, nor circumcision, nor communion plays any part in the gift of eternal salvation when a person believes. Again, it's a remembrance of it. These are signs of it. And so, you know, I ask myself this, why has God ordered it this way? Why has he ordained these things in this manner? You know, why, why did God establish justification by faith apart from the law of works and ordinances? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, and, and also, this is actually what Paul is, kind of, is answering here. He says, because he's using Abraham as a primary example, okay? And he says that he that's Abraham, might be the father of all those, all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles. Why? That the righteousness might be imputed to them also. You know, we're talking about God's divine order of things. Do you realize that God and his sovereignty this was Abraham's response. He knew Abraham's, what Abraham's response would be, but he didn't impose that on him. He didn't make him respond. Abraham acted independently. He chose to believe God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And do you see this at work? And do you see God's sovereignty at work? And he uses this one man, Abraham, who was promised, he was given through promise, Again, we'll talk about that promise next week because that's exactly where Paul goes. So that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. You see, this verse demonstrates God's faithfulness to his unconditional promise that he would make Abraham a great nation. And it is by this, then, principle, again, of, 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 of God's you know, faithfulness, his unconditional promise, and the fact that God 
then imputes righteousness through faith that God is, the, is just and he is the justifier. Just like that judge. You know, he, had to, he declared the verdict, this is the law, this is how it is. But he steps down, you know, after taking off his robe and he says, you know, I'm going to pay for that for you. You know, here's the fine, it's paid in full. Will you receive it? Because as, as your fellow man, I'm going to pay for it for you. As the judge, I'm willing to accept it. And that's, you know, again, that's where God is just. He's the justifier because he paid for a sin debt that wasn't his. He paid for yours and mine sin debt. And so Abraham becomes this example then to us of one who is saved apart from works, apart from ordinances. Again, he was from Ur of the Chaldeans, probably moon worshiper. You know, he was ungodly. And and, and God spoke to him, and he believed. And that's why we say it is through Scripture alone. You know, it is the Word of God that brings about life. And that's what has to be presented and promoted and before someone is, has something to respond to. Now, maybe they've heard that word. Maybe it's been planted, and maybe you come along and water it some other way. You know, but it's God who gives the increase. It's God alone that saves. It's the Holy Spirit, then, that baptizes that person. You see, it's the triune God that saves. You know, based off of it was the will of the Father for the Son to go and die on the cross to pay for men's sin. God and, and Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, Jesus, as the man there, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, you know, if I don't, if there's another way, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. You see, that's, may our hearts get there to where we, uh, allow the word to say, look, this is what I want, but not my will, but your will. So, and he goes on, he says that the righteousness might be imputed to them also, to those uncircumcised, to us, and the father of circumcision to those who not o- only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So we'll we'll start stop there because I'm gonna we'll we'll get into that more next week. But take away again from today, you know, Paul is really now focusing on the fact that faith, you know, without as we said earlier. You know, he doesn't say it that here, but his emphasis through these verses are on faith. You know, that was the question, when and how and all those things. And he's, he's looking at faith itself apart from works and ordinances. And so uh, we'll continue. I don't think I have it on there. We'll pick up there uh, next week uh, and... Uh, uh, but uh, this will be a good transition, and uh, uh, we're doing okay on time. But let's let's pray and uh, t- take a few moments, and then we'll uh, transition into our communion. Uh, Father, again, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you uh, for just the correction that it offers. Uh, I pray that we would be uh, willing to uh, receive it, Lord, and. Um, Lord, turn our, just where there are areas in our lives that we uh, might not be um, um, trusting you, Lord. Uh, may we, may we trust you, may we hear your word, and may we simply believe it. Uh, abandoning, Lord, the, the, the whatever we've heard, whatever 
however many years it's been. For me, it was 30 plus years when I heard the gospel message, the true gospel, the true gospel message, if I might use that, the gospel of Christ, the actual gospel of Christ, and also what I must do to be saved. Um, and I had added a lot of stuff to it. And, but Lord, I know that people are confused because for the majority, there is a gospel message out there that, that, that confuses Lord and to have mercy, have grace on us. And, um, and may we, um, Lord, simply, if we're going to repent, if we're going to change our mind, may we change our mind about who you are and uh, the promises that you've promised to those, Lord, who, who simply trust you and believe you. And so today, as we get ready to enter into the celebration of communion, Lord, may we simply, um, Lord, first of all, remember, again, it's, it's all about you. This is all about your son. This is all about Christ Jesus. And, uh, and Lord, um, again, if we, if our mind, wh whatever, Lord, if, we, if we've sinned, uh, Lord, we, can, we just want to take a few moments now before we get into communion, Lord, that if we've sinned, uh, that we uh, allow a few moments for us to get back into uh, fellowship with you um, and uh, as we uh, get ready uh, to partake. And again, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thankful, thankful that you're true. And uh, thank you that you, uh, Lord, have related to us in this manner that we, we, get to, we get to share in this, Lord. And, uh, and we do look forward to sharing this uh, with you again in your Father's kingdom. But in the meantime, Lord, we get to, we get to be witnesses to one another of uh, what it is that you've done for us and the work that you did for us of, of, uh, of uh, salvation, Lord, of justification and our ultimate glorification, Lord. And um, we just worship you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.